10 years ago, a minor event created a major controversy, which apparently helped elect Donald Trump, led to the rise of the alt right, and birthed the political conspiracy theory of QAnon, as well as many other things, apparently. Pizzagate, the firing of James Gunn, the mantra of learn to code, the creation of post-truth, the criticism of that Netflix movie Cuties, the January 6th US Capitol attack, the creation of weaponized memes and doxing, the popularization of white replacement theory, the reason why people called Amber Heard Amber Turd in the Johnny Depp trial, a golden age of disinformation and unapologetic fascism, the black pill movement and incels, the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband, the pushback against woke corporations. Yep, it was all connected. All of it. And as for the people involved, they made it onto mainstream TV, they went on Joe Rogan and late night talk shows, ran for office and gave talks at the UN, all about this one thing. This was Gamergate. 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 And it was, somehow, one of the biggest controversies of our times, modern history in the making, something that changed the course of the internet forever. And now it's back, apparently. So what is going on? Well, better check in with the most reliable news source on the internet, daily YouTube videos. Sweet Baby Inc. is not a consulting group. Sweet Baby Inc. is here to destroy video games. They are a disease. They are a absolute disease in the video game world and they need to be treated as such. There is nothing more going on here than one massive grift to exploit an ideological Marxist hole which is rotting the West. That literally is actively trying to undermine Western civilization by their own admission. They demand you shut up, submit, and bend every single joint in your body to their every whim. They hate us and they want us gone or even dead would be preferable to them. They despise you if you're a gamer and you're a white male. That is the one thing that all of these game companies seemingly have in common. Uh, these people are fucking scum. Like, there's no other way to describe this. You are fucking scum. These people are evil. The people involved with Sweet Baby Inc. are evil. They do not deserve your respect. They do not deserve to for you to dance around this issue. Wow, and there was me being all sarcastic because I thought this might be overblown. But no, this does sound really serious. There is an existential threat to the entire gaming industry and Western civilization. And they want us dead? People's lives are on the line? And these people are evil? This is a battle between good and evil? And these people hate all gamers? But I mean, I play games. I'm a gamer. So that means they must hate me. Wow, surely not. I mean, nobody could ever hate me. I'm so likable. Well, if it really is this serious, I guess it's ethically irresponsible to not talk about it. So... Here we go. Gamergate 2. Wow, they really will make a sequel to just about fucking anything these days. Gamergate was about controlling the narrative. That's why it blew up, and why it kept going, and why people keep talking about it even years later. You see, there were two sides, and one said this was a movement about ethics and games journalism, and the other said this was a misogynistic harassment campaign pushing back against women in gaming. These two narratives contradicted and were in competition with each other, and so people fought to try to prove their side right and the other side wrong. It is a consumer movement that rejects sloppy standards in, in reporting about video games. Ethics and journalism is not what's happening in any way. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually men going after women in really hostile, aggressive ways. Mm -hmm. That's what Gamergate is about. It's about mm -hmm. like, ter like terrorizing women for being involved in this industry, for being involved in this hobby. The second half of it is the social justice warriors we mentioned briefly. There is a sort of insurgent um, move in video games uh, from a couple of wacky left-wing feminists, and these are sort of far-left, Israel-hating, socialist weirdos. The strange thing about this case is there are a lot of right-wing American celebrities who've kind of 
endorsed this and given people uh, something to rally around and that's why a lot of people are attacking the likes of Zoe Quinn who we just saw on that on that VT. Bombarding her with mostly anonymous tweets and messages. I will whip you when I get the chance. Hiding behind usernames and claims of free speech. Some people believe that some of these in fact death threats or some of these threats aren't real. Uh -huh. And that what they're doing is trying to discredit the Gamergate movement by making it out that they're all these misogynists and creeps. There were YouTube videos, media articles, social media censorship, doxing and many abusive comments, and a whole lot more as the fight for the right to write history grew and grew. In time, people would see this sort of thing all over the internet. This is the culture war. It's internet politics. Left versus right, progressive versus anti-progressive, SJW versus anti-SJW, woke versus anti-woke, the names might change, but many things still remain the same. And while it does feel a little silly to see Gamergate being invoked continuously, year after year on all sorts of other culture war issues, there is a connection. The mistake these articles tend to make is in portraying Gamergate as the cause, Whereas in reality, it was actually just an earlier symptom of the real thing connecting everything. Still, there was something that did make Gamergate a bit different, which was that it was early enough in this great culture war of ours that people could pretend it wasn't about politics. I mean, ethics in games journalism isn't a left-right issue. And surely both the left and right can agree that sexism and harassment are bad, and that death threats and doxing are going too far. And, at the start, Gamergate wasn't about politics. It was one minuscule event that snowballed and streisanded its way into the mainstream. That event was a single blog post in August 2014 that one game developer made about his ex, Zoe Quinn, claiming she had cheated on him multiple times. The Zoe post was about this couple's relationship and barely even touched on ethical concerns in games journalism, and its creator, Aaron Joni, did not go on to become a Gamergate supporter. Still, this post did carry an implication of receiving favorable treatment within the industry as a result of personal relationships, and it was posted on several gaming forums, which led people to search for other examples of potential conflicts of interest and nepotism within gaming media. The story then made its way to YouTube, where it was first covered by a then small YouTuber named Mundane Matt, who soon received a DMCA claim on the video, apparently from Zoe Quinn herself. This led to more attention, and was the start, but by no means end, of the Streisand effect, where trying to shut down a story backfires. In fact, at the height of those first months, almost every major gaming forum would try to shut down or heavily control all discussion of these events, claiming them to be against their site rules on harassment, and this included some pretty big sites like Reddit and 4chan. And this bit was genuinely surprising. Keep in mind, this was 2014 4chan, back when the website still had a reputation as being this controversial Wild West anything goes, free speech absolutist space, and the message this ban of Gamergate discussion sent was that anything goes, and people can speak about anything they want, anything in the world, except Gamergate. Meanwhile, at the same time that the largest gaming forums were telling people they weren't allowed to discuss it, Gamergate was still being talked about in the media, where it had made its way to major mainstream outlets like CNN and the New York Times, and where anti-Gamergate figures were appearing on late-night TV to tell their side of the story. This made people angry, or for those already angry, angrier. And angry people sometimes cause harassment. And so Gamergate was this event that evolved and escalated continuously. Or in the words of the Gamergate-focused Law and Order SVU episode, What happened? These guys, they just, they just can't stand women in gaming. <sighs> what did they do to you? They leveled up. I wonder if we've now reached a point in time where many people don't know this exists. Go home, gamer girl. What the hell is your problem? You and your boss. Reina Punjabi only got this feminazi game made by being a slut. This is real. It aired in early 2015 
and it gets even better because the main Gamergate terrorist, yes, terrorist, is played by YouTuber and I guess WWE star Logan Paul. And not only is this a beautiful little piece of internet history, it also rather encapsulates where the anti-Gamergate side might have went wrong. Depicting people who disagree with you as terrorists isn't the best way to make them change their mind, or make their arguments go away, or make anyone more empathetic. And this also applies to broad claims that everyone in a movement is racist or sexist. If this does anything, it's probably just radicalizing people, making them double down, making hate intensify, and furthering distrust and division on an already divisive topic. So this is hopefully a brief snapshot of what Gamergate was like. Everyone wanted to control the narrative, and as the story grew, so too did the animosity and the harassment and the direct involvement of left versus right politics. Remember, this is back in 2014, when feminism was one of the hottest topics on the internet and where there had already been a gamers versus feminists clash over the tropes versus women in games videos of Anita Sarkeesian. These two competing sides of progressive versus anti-progressive had already been drawn up, and so when Gamergate arrived, with the inciting event being over who a female game developer may have slept with, this progressive versus anti-progressive sentiment fell into place perfectly, and in time this political clash overshadowed and eventually consumed those initial concerns over ethics in games journalism. There's obviously a lot more you could say about Gamergate, but believe it or not, I don't especially want to relitigate all of Gamergate's many competing claims. This is a subject people have vastly different opinions and possibly perspectives on, and it's a subject people can be quite sensitive over. And I get that. I was there. I remember a lot of this pretty well, and there were just so many claims that were made, at least some of which seemed like bullshit and seeing people promote things that weren't true, and seeing them spread and gain legitimacy all amidst a lot of genuine hatred, well, that sort of stuff does make people feel invested. It makes people care, it generates an emotional response. I get it. I was there. And now I'm here. Gamergate 2. So, what minor event kicked things off this time? Sweet Baby Inc. are a small narrative development and consultation studio who place a particular emphasis on diversity and inclusivity. The current still ongoing controversy took off after an employee at Sweet Baby Inc. asked his followers on Twitter to report a Sweet Baby Inc. detected Steam group as well as its creator, for harassment. This happened on February 29th, 2024. But while this was when the controversy exploded, it wasn't when it started. And it wasn't when I first saw people talk about this company. Sweet Baby Inc. became a subject of discussion on 4chan after the release of Marvel Spider-Man 2 and Alan Wake 2 in October of last year. Both of these games included Sweet Baby Inc. in their credits, and both of these games featured progressive or woke elements. The original threads on this are hard to find due to 4chan not being great for archived content, but the Kiwi Farms thread they led to does still exist, and as of writing this, this thread now has over 6,000 replies and almost 1 million views, meaning it has been quite widely seen. The thread begins by giving credit to a user of 4chan's video game board, and calling this one of the biggest scandals in gaming history. It then includes a lot of images taken from threads on 4chan, such as screenshots of Sweet Baby Inc.'s website, screenshots of games they've worked on showing their progressive elements, and information on some of the people who work at the company, like Kim Belair, Sweet Baby Inc.'s CEO, who is described as a Jewish woman destroying video games as we speak. I feel it's worth pointing out that I don't think Kim Belair actually is Jewish, 
and the only evidence provided is a screenshot of a different person who is a professor of Jewish literature, with Kim Belair showing up under people also viewed, but maybe I'm just missing something here. Still, it's the accusation of being Jewish that I think is more relevant than its accuracy. Sweet Baby Inc. were also accused of being possibly pedophiles, due to the company name including the word baby, and the similarities between their logo and symbols apparently released by the FBI that supposedly represent this kind of thing. Again, discussion was much more active on 4chan than Kiwi Farms at this point, but the early pages of the Kiwi Farms thread do give an indication of what these early discussions on both websites were like, and several users did actually suggest creating a list of games the company worked on. Quote, Every single game that studio was involved in needs to be documented and blacklisted. I'm thinking something similar to the Traitors of America page. Now, this is still October 2023, but we can see that these discussions were indeed reaching Sweet Baby Inc. because there are screenshots of people being blocked by the company's Twitter account, with the account eventually going private in response. And I think it would be accurate to say that some of this must count as harassment. I mean, Kim Belair is repeatedly called a Jewish file, there's plenty of use of the N-word, and there's also your more standard accusations, like that this company is trying to destroy whiteness, and so on. Still, this is all a minor event at this point, mostly limited to 4chan, but some YouTubers did either see this, or hear about it, and decided to make videos covering it. The first I can find is from Heels vs Babyface, where he basically criticizes the story of Alan Wake 2 and blames Sweet Baby Inc. for all of its problems. So what exactly does Sweet Baby Inc., which by the way sounds like a dating site for paedophiles, have to do with Alan Wake 2? Well, according to their own website, they worked on character arc, voice, and sensitivity reading. And by sensitivity reading, we of course mean someone who takes a body of work and makes sure that it conforms to the ESG DIE intersectional far left ideology because they're a bunch of fascists and of course you must conform to their worldview or be destroyed. Basically, they're the Gestapo of the writing world. The next reasonably sized YouTuber I can find covering it was Kayo, sorry if that's pronounced wrong, who said this. What do you think a game like this, Alan Woke and BlackRock 2 have in common? They all slid through this self-described narrative consulting company. It was also covered on the podcast Side Scrollers soon after who made three videos about Sweet Baby Inc, the first being titled This Company Is Why Your Video Games Suck, where they literally just showed screenshots of 4chan threads to describe what the company is and does. And finally, it was also covered multiple times by YouTuber Griffin Gaming. If you're familiar with the company Sweet Baby Inc, you would understand exactly why this story unfolds the way it does, as with so many other Sony games and video games in the industry at large. Griffin Gaming's next video is good at showing how conspiratorial the Sweet Baby Inc discourse was in this early stage. Today, what we're going to be talking about is pretty crazy, dude, and if you would have asked me a year ago if I believed all this could be possible, I honestly don't know if I would because it just seems really outlandish, but I 100% can assure you that it is actually happening. Now, given the sensitive nature of this topic and the fact that the previous video I so much as mentioned this organization that we're going to be talking about in got age-restricted last time, I decided not only to script this video for the sake of my channel, but also to demonstrate whether or not the organization has such close ties with the tech industry where they can actually influence a company like YouTube or other social media platforms to suppress any mention or criticism of them. So Griffin Gaming suggests this company is so powerful they can force Google to censor videos on their behalf, citing his previous age-restricted video. It has been brought to my attention recently that an organization named Sweet Baby Inc. has been working behind the scenes for over half a decade at this point with the one goal of injecting woke political ideologies into video games where they previously didn't exist or belong to further the message. As we typically see from the most sinister actors in any industry, they often hide behind a harmless or infantile, in this case, mask to conceal 
reveal their true intentions, but make no mistake, this organization has completely and fully infiltrated the industry and has its hands in over 70 different video game projects and has a clientele across the majority of the video game industry's major publishers and platform owners. I have to admit, I do quite like this video because Griffin Gaming regularly says things like, this isn't some conspiracy at this point. This isn't some opinion or subjective take on this entire issue. This is an objectively provable fact. This isn't some conspiracy at this point. This is an objectively true thing that's occurring. This is definitely not just some conspiracy at this point. But then he also says stuff like, we Baby Inc. appears to be the ESG enforcement wing of BlackRock or other ESG champions within the video game industry to help problematic publishers and developers step in line with the so-called socially acceptable ideologies that further promote this woke agenda to ensure that stock prices stay high and the cash injections keep coming from companies like BlackRock. So yeah, zero conspiratorial thinking, nothing but the objective truth, and by the way, Sweet Baby Inc. is the ESG enforcement wing of BlackRock, one of the biggest companies in the world, and they are powerful enough to censor all criticism of them on YouTube. Now, this was all in October or November, and at this stage, this still wasn't a major story. But it is possible that Sweet Baby Inc. might have felt this new negative attention. Anyway, I'll come back to ESG and BlackRock. For now, I want to establish a basic timeline of events. After this initial wave of videos, this story quieted down a bit, although there were new claims that Sweet Baby Inc. were working on games like Grand Theft Auto 6 or The Witcher Remake. Things didn't really pick up again, though, until the release of the next big game Sweet Baby Inc. had actually worked on, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, at the end of January 2024. This led to a new wave of videos, some from people already mentioned and some from new channels. Here's a few examples. Suicide Squad, like Spider-Man 2, Alan Wake 2, and God of War Ragnarok before it are all clients of the woke company known as Sweet Baby Inc. I just want to give you some quick examples of how Sweet Baby has weaseled their influence into other games. Remember that Spider-Man 2 has a mission where you play as a deaf girl who vandalizes property and forces the player to stand still and witness a gay couple asking each other out to prom by removing your agency as a player. Then you have Alan Wake 2, which originally had Saga Anderson as a white woman, but weirdly enough, once Sweet Baby was attached, Saga suddenly turned into a black woman out of nowhere. Here's Kim Belair. She's the CEO of Sweet Baby. Everything ruining games today stems from the agenda of this person. By a group of really disgusting filthy people which go under the banner of Sweet Baby Inc. The game might be called The Suicide Squad Kills the Justice League, but Sweet Baby Stink killed the Western gaming industry. A Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League fails to meet Warner Brothers' expectations, sharking up the wrong tree. I wonder why that is. Maybe when you invite snakes into your den, like Sne Sweet Baby, uh, this is what happens. Sweet Baby Inc. is the successful feminist frequency. That phrase alone should fill you with dread. Now, this is all still before the major event that most people think of when they hear Sweet Baby Inc. Combined, these videos had several million views, and there were also many, many 4chan threads which were seen by even more people. There was also some strong words said on YouTube and on forums including pretty big conspiracy theories. And I could imagine for a small company of just 16 employees with little social media reach that this might have been a bit stressful. Anyway, the next part is the well-known bit. On the 29th of January, Steam user Cabrutus created the Sweet Baby Inc. detected Steam Curator Group, which warned people away from games Sweet Baby Inc. had worked on. Although back then it wasn't always the correct games. This group garnered a modest few thousand users, but then one month later, on February 29th, a Sweet Baby Inc. employee, Chris Kindred, called for both the Steam group and Cabrutus to be reported, claiming the group to be against Steam's code of conduct. Clearly, Valve didn't agree with this claim, as neither the group nor Cabrutus have been banned, and instead this call to action backfired massively, as this group now has over 360,000 members. A lot of people have talked about this particular event already, and for what it's worth, my opinion isn't much different. 
People have the right to make political games, and other people have the right to boycott or talk about those political games. So I do think it was wrong to call for the group's creator to be reported, and it seems to be incorrect to claim the group was against code of conduct. Although, given the circumstances and earlier harassment that did exist, I can also understand why this employee might have overreacted this way. Regardless, this created a clear Streisand effect, just like the OG Gamergate, and now even larger figures started covering the story. This is actually like a really kind of a big story. So what they're trying to do, come together and mass report and ban the people that are running this different page. Who is Sweet Baby Inc? Well, they were involved with a lot of big companies in the gaming industry. Here is a list of their clients. And when you look around and see some of the names listed and the fact that this company started in 2018, it's adding up, isn't it? Why a lot of these companies have gone downhill since they started working with Sweet Baby Inc. Multiple employees of Sweet Baby Inc. Went on, went on a tirade on Twitter, including this user who led an entire harassment campaign against the creators of the group and demanded that their followers report this group and its creator. We aim to make games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive for everyone. That's a lot of Orwellian 1984-style doublespeak right there. You have these developers that are trying to be influential in the industry and are influential in the industry. These people that come in, rewrite things, diversify it, wokeify it. Fans have had enough. Fans don't like it. And when you have a laundry list of failures that you might be associated with, yeah, I bet that's why you're losing your temper now. I bet that's why you're begging for these things to be banned because you know that you're fucked. Diversity, inclusion, and representation. Words that you know will destroy an entertainment property immediately. The moment that you hear them, you might as well forget it. The project is dead. So Sweet Baby Inc. has been tied to all sorts of narrative decisions where essentially the women are ugly or the games are terrible. Sweet Baby Inc. employees incite harassment campaign against the Steam curator. The thing is, Honey Infant now have carte blanche to come in and rewrite your new game in any way they see fit, because their word is basically law now. And because all they really care about is making themselves feel better by lecturing the rest of the world about social and political issues that specifically matter to them, they begin to make changes. Lots of changes. Narrative is one of the most important parts of entertainment, and yet people are getting paid to intentionally destroy it. And they're proud of it. And that's generally what it was, right? Like, people did not want any game associated with the writing works that these people were involved in, right? That's pretty much what the general idea was. And again, if we're talking about boycott lists, those are not harassment lists, okay? There was no harassment necessarily from at least what I've researched on this group being directed towards anybody, right? And so the story grew. Except now, Sweet Baby Inc. were not only destroying games by forcing their personal politics into other developers' work and making them woke for ESG points, but also Sweet Baby Inc. were the ones who started everything by inciting a harassment campaign against an innocent Steam user. This would soon lead to attention from several political commentators as well, including libs of TikTok, James Lindsay, Elon Musk, and well-known gaming enthusiast Matt Walsh. Anyway, these people on uh, Steam found that Sweet Baby Inc. has contracted with major publishers to push pr the principles of DEI in video games as aggressively as possible. This would also lead to a still ongoing hunt to try and find clips or tweets of Sweet Baby Inc. employees or Sweet Baby Inc. defenders, either about how they approach their goals of diversity and inclusion, or just anything that might be anti-white or anti-gamer. Examples were also found of other narrative consultancy groups or diversity and inclusion focused groups or just questionable statements from other individuals in the industry. Here are the most talked about and controversial clips that have been discovered, presented for now without commentary. Do not wait until the end to call your consultants. Bring them in at the beginning and instead of asking them, hey, is this very racist thing we did very racist or is this deeply offensive thing we did, deeply offensive, are you hurt by it? Ask them what they want to see, like ask them what would thrill them, what would bring them joy, and if you have a team lead, put that request to them very, very early. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher-ups, and if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, 
go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's gonna happen if they don't give you what you want. Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that all out as a joke, but it's actually very, very true because Validate has a team of mostly, mostly all people of color. We have no white people on our team. Um, I did that because I wanted to create a safe environment. And I know the best way for an environment to be safe is to be around people who are just like me. Um, and I'm not saying that white people in the industry are creating safe, unsafe environments. I'm not saying that. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying that sometimes it is hard to work with white people because they think that something made okay, but it was really a microaggression. And no one wants to deal with that while they're trying to make a game that they love. We still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater to them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. We feed them the same thing that we know that they love and we keep on feeding it. We're like, here you go, we, you love it. Eat this, eat this, eat this. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, oh no, thank you. I do not want this. Then there are the most controversial tweets. One followed the death of Dragon Ball creator Akira Toriyama, saying Toriyama gave us the best and worst black characters in anime, with the worst presumably referencing Mr. Popo, who does look a little like old blackface cartoons, but this still led to lots of YouTube videos expressing outrage at Sweet Baby Inc. for disrespecting Toriyama after his death. Then there was a tweet of one developer, not related to Sweet Baby Inc., saying that none of their default characters in their demo were white males, which again produced a major response. Another tweet from an Xbox employee about minorities existing in gaming was also discovered and got a similar response. Controversy also centered around another group, Black Girl Gamers, who focus on growing the influence and representation of black women in gaming. The Black Girl Gamers discourse led to another controversial tweet from a BBC presenter who said, quote, can we agree that for round two of this, it can be the final purge of these kinds of gamers, which led to widespread accusations that she was invoking genocidal and Nazi rhetoric against gamers. During this period, some other games media articles also caused controversy for promoting progressive or woke ideas. One article from IGN calling for Capcom to address racism in a potential Resident Evil 5 remake received a lot of negative attention over the claim of racism. Discussions around the protagonist of upcoming action game Stella Blade got even more attention and was again centered on an IGN article, this time from IGN France, which referred to the protagonist as, quote, bland and a doll sexualized by someone who has never seen a woman. The outrage caused by this led to a retraction and official apology from IGN. Really though, at this point, there have been too many minor controversies to cover everything. Many YouTubers were, and likely still are, creating daily YouTube videos on these events and all the problematic things people have found. Meaning there are thousands of videos by this point, hundreds of which come from sizable creators, all expressing a certain amount of outrage at the woke games industry, or woke developers, or woke journalists. And speaking of journalists, much like with Gamergate before it, there has, quite predictably, been a media response to these events that involved siding with Sweet Baby Inc. The first article came from Kotaku and was titled Sweet Baby Inc. Doesn't Do What Some Gamers Think It Does. This article doesn't mention the call to report the Sweet Baby Inc. detected Steam Group at all and instead focuses on Sweet Baby Inc.'s work, claiming that Sweet Baby Inc. doesn't force anything into games and that diversity is happening naturally, claiming that the influence of Sweet Baby Inc. or narrative consultants in general has been greatly exaggerated, and claiming that statements from developers who have worked with Sweet Baby Inc. directly contradict the claims made against them. For example, one of the most widespread accusations is that Sweet Baby Inc. changed the race of one of the main characters in Alan Wake 2 from white to black. The evidence used to support this claim is a teaser from the 2016 game Quantum Break that shows what seems to be the same character as White, as well as an interview that confirmed Sweet Baby Inc. were involved with refining this character's voice and story arc. In response to this, Alan Wake 2's director said this claim is, quote, absolutely not true, but many responded by accusing him of lying. 
Something similar would happen with people who worked on Suicide Squad and Spider-Man 2. Further articles would come from PC Gamer, Eurogamer, Aftermath, The Guardian, Wired, The Verge, CBC and more. And while these articles are not all the same, I don't think it's worth explaining each of them individually. In general, they are fairly similar to the first article and maintain the idea that Sweet Baby Inc. is not forcing developers to change their games, does not have as much influence as has been claimed, and that this series of events is primarily a harassment campaign against Sweet Baby Inc. and other progressive voices in the industry. And at this point, I think it's worth remembering Gamergate and how it quickly became about people doing whatever they could to control the narrative. This led to gaming media and the gaming industry being completely united on one side and Gamergate supporters pushing back on the other, with both doubling down and doing everything they could to win the argument. And now, here we are again. Except, it doesn't seem the same this time. In the years since Gamergate, the relevancy and reputation of game journalists has been diminished. Games media has become very political, which has alienated some, maybe a lot, of their potential audience, and making fun of game journalists has become a pretty common pastime on the internet, with even not usually political figures being happy to dunk on game journalists whenever they mess up. And as this has been happening, traditional media in general has declined, and so it doesn't seem like games media has the power to affect the narrative to the extent that it might have in the past, and the media response in general has been much smaller and quieter this time round. On YouTube, however, it is the exact opposite. Making YouTube videos is much more lucrative now than it was in 2014, with YouTube itself being bigger than ever, and this time it's not new or small channels that are at the forefront, but rather large established channels that have already built an audience specifically around criticizing woke elements in media. Twitter has also changed since Elon Musk took over, with it now seeming less popular with people on the left and more popular with those on the right. And so, overall, when it comes to controlling the narrative, the power balance isn't what it used to be. For example, if you look at tweets of people involved in this new battle for the soul of gaming, it's sweet baby ink defenders who are getting overwhelmingly dogpiled and very often setting their accounts to private soon after evidence of their problematic woke behavior is discovered. As for YouTube, there are likely thousands of Woke Games Bad or Sweet Baby Ink Bad videos at this point, with more being made every day. Meanwhile, there are less than a handful of prominent videos promoting any kind of competing narrative, which also makes for quite the ratio. Usually, when culture war stories blow up like this, people on the left go one way and those on the right go the other, with both sides ultimately just doubling down until a new controversy arrives for people to move on to. This time, however, it doesn't seem like many on the left really care. Maybe because they don't know, or just don't think this warrants a response, which is understandable, there are always other things going on in online politics, but it does seem strange to me that so many usually loud progressive voices within the online gaming world haven't said a word about any of this. Meanwhile, the other side seems more active than ever, making this a rather one-sided controversy, where one side has vastly more control and is able to dogpile anyone who doesn't agree with them into going private and shutting up. Meaning this culture war is basically over. And that is where we're up to. One narrative has emerged victorious, and its victory is now beyond all doubt. Anyway, I have a different narrative. And seeing as we all love free speech and different opinions, and we all hate echo chambers, I guess everyone should be pretty happy with me. First though, it might be worth examining what the winning narrative actually is, because we do all hate echo chambers, so it seems important to make sure no one is in one. Right?
It is worth keeping in mind that narratives do change over time, and not everyone covering these events will believe or say the exact same things. But there are still some commonly repeated aspects that do show up in most videos. The first is that Sweet Baby Inc. are forcing developers to change their games against developers' wishes in order to push a woke agenda. Here are just a few examples taken from some of the most representative channels. The same Sweet Baby Inc. that's responsible for the blackfacing of North Gods because apparently it's an interpretation of mythology. The very same Sweet Baby Inc. that race changed Saga Anderson for Alan Wake 2 for some reason as well. The very same Sweet Baby Inc. responsible for the narrative choices in Spider-Man 2 where devs confirm Miles Morales will be the main Spider-Man going forward. Are you getting just a small idea of what Sweet Baby Inc. are actually there to do to your gaming company. If you don't give us what we want, if you don't capitulate to our demands to put a, a trans black lesbian in a fucking wheelchair in this random video game where it doesn't belong at all, well, we're going to make sure we call you racist and sexist and transphobic and all these things. That is the co-founder of Sweet Baby Inc. saying that if they don't get what they want, they will terrify them with threats. That's right, the social media cancel mob. If you don't put the diversity, inclusion, and representation into the video games that we want, then we are going to destroy you. We've now seen the leader of Sweet Baby admitting that they use coercion tactics to ensure their political messaging makes its way into the games that you buy. If you don't do what I want to a T, I'll use my power to label your entire studio as racist. Then I'll use my power to ensure you don't get job opportunities within this industry ever again if you decide to deny me access to your franchises so that I can force my beliefs and politics into them. Man, it must be so satisfying as a developer to have spent months or even years carefully crafting every detail of the story and characters in your game and then have experts like Honeyed Infant come in and completely rework it right under your nose. Then there is the idea that this is happening for secretive or ulterior financial reasons involving BlackRock or environmental, social and governance, or ESG scores. As well as the fact that people are actually getting clued in to exactly what the company's there to do. To go in there, ESG your game, D-I-E your game, so that your BlackRock funding and Vanguard funding and all of that can keep coming in. They are anti Gamer, the video game consulting company whose sole focus is to make sure that diversity and representation takes center stage in any project they get involved in to make sure to up your DEI score. But wait, there's a problem. All those big financial investment companies will only lend you their money if you can prove that you're good little boys and girls whose games correctly push the, the message. message. So what to do? Well, in this case, you hire an outside consultancy firm to advise you on how to make your upcoming game more compliant. Let's call them, oh, I don't know, Honeyed Infant Incorporated. They are using Sweet Baby because they're trying to make DEI and ESG a, a thing for them. They're trying to get a hold of some of those funds and invest in, investing dollars that BlackRock puts into shit like that. So they bring on these grifters that promise them the ability to get it. And that's what a Sweet Baby is. Then there are the commonly repeated claims that Sweet Baby Inc, and often also their defenders, hate gamers and video games, and often also white people, and that they want to destroy gaming. The employees at Sweet Baby Inc, the people that hate gamers, that all they want to do is push their nonsense down your throat, who want white male gamers out of their space. They don't want to make games for you anymore. They don't want you to play their games. They fucking hate white men. That's the bottom line. Sensitivity and, and representational and inclusive reading. Oh, you mean current day Californian shit, which is a big hit over there in commie Canada right now. White God, black. White girl, black. White hero, black. So inclusion and sensitivity actually just means getting rid of white characters. Gotcha. Sweet Baby Inc. employees showing misunderstanding of an outright disdain for gamers. They hate gamers. They despise you. They despise everything that you stand for. 
Sweet Baby Inc. is not a consulting group. Sweet Baby Inc. is here to destroy video games. Sweet Baby Inc. doesn't like you if you are a gamer. They hate gamers and they hate video games. Honeyed Infant is a company staffed almost exclusively by hardcore political activists who either couldn't make it as actual game developers or never particularly cared about video games in the first place. Yet as soon as we baby got involved with Spider-Man, it was obvious that anyone who is white, straight, or male must be ruined to make way for the new age of progress in their minds, I guess. And finally, there is the claim that Sweet Baby Inc. started all this by calling for the Steam Group to be reported on February 29th, and so Sweet Baby Inc. are the real harassers. How did this start? Sweet Baby Inc. employees attacked gamers. They tried to get them banned off Steam, tried to have their groups uh, taken down, and tried to have their entire Steam accounts taken down. That's how this started. Sweet Baby Inc. are the harassers. They are the reason this is happening. They are the harassers. All you need to do with the slightest bit of research, and you would know that. Now, what kicked all this off was this Steam curator that says, hey, we're gonna let you know if Sweet Baby worked on a game. That all of this started with criticism being directed towards a Sweet Baby Inc. employee who started a harassment campaign against the Steam group that was tracking their company's games and clients. That's how it started. Now, I do have a history of criticizing certain over-the-top progressive elements in games, and sometimes also criticizing games media as well as criticizing the culture war. So you could say I'm quite sympathetic to the idea of woke elements in gaming going too far. That said, there is a lot about this dominant narrative that seems biased, inaccurate, or just greatly exaggerated. I mean, for starters, there's no reason to believe that Sweet Baby Inc. are forcing developers to change their games against developers' wishes. And this is something that has been directly refuted by people who worked on these games multiple times. It also doesn't make sense that a narrative consultant, i.e. a contractor hired to do specific work, would have this level of absolute power to override creative decisions. The main piece of evidence used to support this claim is the Terrify Them clip from Kim Belair. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher-ups, and if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. In context, however, this isn't about cancelling game companies or extortion. In fact, straight after this, Kim says she's basically joking, and her actual point is what's shown on screen. Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that all out as a joke, but it's actually very, very true because if you start to consider the people who are player and audience facing and who have to deal with mitigating harm and with keeping the sentiment around their game and their project positive, there's like a genuine value that you can impress upon them with um, both ethically and financially. You can say this is important. And it's also a valid discussion to have because if you're working with a very thin narrative budget and you work in AAA, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised or dismayed by the amount of money that marketing can give you. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this, but this hardly seems like proof that Sweet Baby Inc. has the power to do whatever they want to a game and are overriding other developers. Then there is the idea that this is all happening because of ESG and or BlackRock. Conspiracy theories about BlackRock have been around on the internet for a while, which is clearly not new to me, as I've had jokes about BlackRock in videos as far back as 2020. That said, these are conspiracy theories. BlackRock does have a lot of assets, but this isn't a sign of conspiracy, it's because they're a financial asset manager. They allow other investors, i.e. people like you or me, to invest in parts of the stock market via index funds. These index funds track specific indices like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, and all information for them is publicly available. BlackRock isn't playing favorites here, or picking and choosing who gets money, and they don't tank a company's share price to punish naughty companies for not doing what they want. 
like including enough diverse characters in a video game. Surprisingly enough, the stock market is quite strictly regulated, and something like this would be easily visible. And people do tend to pay attention to the stock market. As for ESG, it certainly is real, and an ESG score could potentially impact certain investors who wish to prioritize ethical concerns or responsible investing over maximizing returns. There are a few problems with the ESG narrative, however. For starters, most of the companies shown as sweet baby and clients aren't publicly listed, i.e. they are not on the stock market, and therefore they don't even have an ESG score for Sweet Baby Inc. to improve. And as for the other companies, it's hard to see how exactly hiring Sweet Baby Inc. would improve an ESG score. I mean, feel free to go read about how ESG scores are determined if you want. I have, it is really fun reading. But basically, ESG measures many different things, one of which includes diversity. But when it says diversity, it means in relation to hiring practices and anti-discriminatory measures in the workplace, not the skin color of video game characters. Remember, ESG scores apply to all publicly listed companies, and most companies don't make games or other media, so that's not what it refers to. And even then, ESG investing is a pretty tiny percent of total investing to begin with, Okay, future me here editing the video, and I feel I need to interrupt to say I was actually being way too generous in this section. I've now looked at quite a few different ESG score methodologies, and the simple reality is that most ESG scores don't even measure diversity in any way. Here is MSCI, which breaks ESG down into 33 measurable factors used to determine the score, and guess what? Diversity isn't one of them. Drill down even further into human capital development and you will find under a subsection of a subsection of a subsection that diversity is mentioned under possible controversies, but that's it. That's the only mention of diversity outside of biodiversity in the entire massive methodology. And that's the reality of it. ESG is almost entirely data-driven and there isn't much diversity data to measure. And before someone says, why are you using MSCI? Well, MSCI is what BlackRock actually uses for their main ESG funds, but feel free to check other methodologies for more evidence of me being right. The entire ESG thing is a dumb conspiracy theory pushed by people who don't even seem to understand what ESG is. All right, back to the video for me to say that last bit in a more polite way. So ESG just seems to be being used as a convenient boogeyman to fuel conspiratorial thinking. And if it is more than this, then surely the onus is on the ones making the claim to provide evidence of this, which no one has done. On the other hand, Kimberlair has been asked directly whether there is any connection between Sweet Baby Inc. and ESG funding, and she has, on record, said that there is no truth to this and that it's frankly absurd. This doesn't mean companies don't still care about diversity, equity and inclusion, independent of ESG scores and BlackRock, but that's something openly acknowledged and talked about all the time. Most of the Western corporate world at this point is pro-DEI. Maybe because some people actually think diversity and inclusivity are good things, and even people who don't might still want to virtual signal a bit, or just avoid being sued for discrimination over inadequate hiring practices or something. Or maybe it's all just Larry Fink putting ESG in the water to turn the freaking video game characters gay. Who really knows when both options are so equally plausible? Keep in mind, conspiracy theories are hard to disprove by design, but the burden of proof lies on the one making the claim. As for the claims that these people hate gamers, hate white men, and hate the gaming industry, I'll get to that later. And hopefully, I've already shown that this started long before the call to report the Sweet Baby Inc. detected Steam group, even if that call was still wrong. Anyway, now that we've heard the winning narrative, mostly in its champion's own words, let me give you a different narrative to consider, and you tell me which one seems more likely. Mm -hmm. 
There are a lot of progressive people in the video game industry. That's it. That explains all parts of this story. Like why Sweet Baby Inc. exists, why anyone hires them, why plenty of game characters are black or gay or subversive in some way, why a lot of bad games are woke, why the media was happy to defend Sweet Baby Inc., why people can find the occasional overly progressive and dumb tweet from people working in the industry, everything, really, all of this story can be explained easily if you believe this one single statement. A lot of people working in the games industry are progressive. So I guess the vital part is proving this statement. I mean, you could do a statistical count of how many game developers have pronouns in their bios or something, but is that actually necessary? Does anyone even need proof of this? Everyone who knows much about the industry knows it's true. Evidence for it is literally everywhere, and even if it wasn't, most people working in this industry are young and college educated, two demographics that lean strongly left. Hell, this is an industry where when Disco Elysium won a game award, one of its writers thanked Marx and Engels, and the audience cheered. The games industry is full of left-wing people. And what happens if you have a lot of progressive game developers? Well, they make games that reflect their personal beliefs and politics, i.e. they make progressive or woke games. So if most game developers are woke, it logically follows that most games will have woke elements. No conspiracy needed. And as games, like most things, follow a standard distribution where most things are of mediocre quality, it also makes sense that the majority of disappointing games will be woke, because that's how statistics work. If most things are A, and most things are also B, then most things that are A will also be B, but that doesn't prove a causal link, and it applies just as much if you swap disappointing with successful. Go woke, go broke is just a political slogan that people repeat because they wish it was true. It's always relied on cherry-picking examples to support it, which is exactly what people did with both Sweet Baby Inc. and video games in general. I mean, of the big games Sweet Baby Inc. worked on, three of them were successful, and one of them was not. And yet the success of these other games just gets conveniently ignored. Really though, a 75% hit rate is pretty great. But forget about reality and just focus on the one game that bombed. Please, please just focus on this one game. Woke games must go broke. Please don't question the message. Of course, it should also be made clear that when this story was blowing up and YouTubers were working hardest to generate engagement on this topic, the games they used to criticize Sweet Baby Inc. over mostly had nothing to do with Sweet Baby Inc. I mean, see for yourself. Anything they get involved with seems to have massive issues. I mean, just take a look at some of these games that they've been involved with, apparently, reportedly, for Spoken. The Saints Row, uh, the Saints Row video game that got absolutely blasted months ago. There's Starfield, Spider-Man, Miles Morales. What else do we have here? But they've got uh, Horizon, Ratchet and Clank, uh, Neo Cab, Gears Tactics, really? Uh, Outriders, the new uh, Indiana Jones game, uh, Gears 5. These are the games that you know Sweet Baby Inc. has been involved in. Starfield, Forspoken, Saints Row, Spider-Man, uh, Mortal Kombat 1, which was boring as hell. I didn't think a Mortal Kombat game could be boring, but I thought it was boring. Uh, and that explains some of the wonky-ass dialogue, too. So this company has essentially made video games across the board more inclusive, but retroactively has also made every single title they've touched worse because of their involvement. And this Steam Curator tool compiles a list of every game that has had Sweet Baby involved. Here, I'll show you some of the games. As you can see, they've worked on quite a few AAA titles already, including the Sony Spider-Man games Ratchet & Clank, which of course introduced Rivet, who outshines Ratchet quite often in that game, because she's a girl, so that's a part of their objective too. And interestingly enough, you'll also notice quite a few games that have either not resonated with fans, such as Starfield, or games that have outright bombed in closed studios, like Forspoken and Saints Row. Starfield, need we even discuss the effect they had on this game's narrative and character design? The Saints Row reboot, Forspoken, 
Sweet Baby Inc. has certainly left their mark on the industry and leaves behind them a wake of disastrous and disappointing games. They were involved in the worst Bethesda game to date, Starfield. You might think I'm being facetious, but I'm really not. Forspoken. Oh. My. God. The dialogue in that game was so bad it was painful. Forspoken sold so poorly it closed down the damn studio that made it how sweet baby walked away from that fire without so much as a scratch is also amazing this is beyond cherry picking it's just entirely fake but to be fair fact checking isn't always part of youtube reporting and using games everyone hates can be quite effective Particularly if you're trying to push a political message like Go Woke, Go Broke, and you need to convince people that this one company is destroying video games. But if you need more proof that Woke does not equal Broke, you could always look at the wokest big budget game from 2023, which is, without doubt, Baldur's Gate 3. I mean, it has... FUCKING PRONOUNS! It also has loads of fucking gender ambiguity! Far more than most games, just check its character creator. Genitals and voice independent of sex, as well as dedicated non binary options. Now that is pretty current day. And it also has fucking current day Californian shit! Yeah, I know, everywhere. I mean, all companions are LGBT, lots of NPCs are too, with two of the main story characters being lesbians, and you have trans characters, including one voiced by the very progressive YouTuber Philosophy Tube, and you've got drag queen characters, something not usually represented and apparently quite controversial with some on the right, and you know, nothing screams respecting traditional family values, like sex with a bear. Which actually is a bit weird, huh? And yet this was deliberately used in marketing as if to try to generate a bit of conservative outrage, which it did. And of course you have the developers and people who actually worked on the game regularly making many progressive statements on social media, even in this very controversy where they have spoken against it multiple times. And Baldur's Gate 3's leading the charge for the Gay Ming Awards for, you know, being so openly progressive. Oh, and then there's all the strong women, the worst wokeness of all. I mean, how many girl bosses do we need, am I right? In fact, all female companions in this game are strong women. Literally, they each have crazy high strength scores. Meanwhile, all men are weak. All of them. They each have low strength scores. Could they be any more obvious? Hell, this is even true for Minsk. 1893 strength Minsk starts Baldur's Gate 2 by bending steel bars with his bare hands, Minsk. And now he has 12 strength and needs to be rescued like a damsel in distress? Now that is disrespect for legacy characters, all to force the woke agenda? Unbelievable! And in a legendary game series that doesn't even belong to Larian. How dare they! No wonder this guy is so angry about this game. Cause we're boring! We're so fucking boring! Oh, wait, no, that was a different game. And actually, anti-woke people seem to avoid talking about Baldur's Gate 3 as much as possible because it quite clearly doesn't fit their narrative. And this is the reality of the situation. Most people don't care about internet culture war bullshit. That's why Go Woke Go Broke relies on so much cherry picking. That's why Baldur's Gate 3 can still be hugely successful despite being hugely woke, and that's why the massive Hogwarts Legacy boycott didn't seem so massive when sales were revealed. Internet outrage isn't remotely representative of normal people. But if you do want to make money from internet outrage, it sure helps to have a scapegoat to blame all your problems on. Like, I don't know, a small, obviously progressive narrative consultant that people can, and already have, made up wild conspiracies about. And Sweet Baby Inc. are clearly very progressive, that part is true. And they are offering a service that seems designed to appeal to other progressive people in the industry, that part's also true. The act of game developers outsourcing writing is pretty normal by now. Over the last decade, outsourcing and contractors have become bigger and bigger parts of AAA game development, 
Presumably because games continue to grow in size and the manpower needed during development varies throughout production, meaning this might be preferable to hiring people that would later need to be fired. Generally though, you'd expect this type of outsourced work to be the least important part of a game, and this does seem to be part of what Sweet Baby Inc. are there for, but they also offer other services, like sensitivity reading and representation-focused consultation, things that have existed and been controversial in the publishing industry already, and things that progressives might see value in, but a lot of non-progressives might not. And that includes me. I don't really understand how any of the material in these games is so sensitive it requires sensitivity readers. Unlike, say, a genuinely culturally sensitive historical war book or something. And I don't understand why gaming companies are even making diverse characters if they themselves don't feel capable of making them feel authentic. So I would never pay money for this type of service, and I don't even see a problem with referring to it as a grift in the sense that this company is trying to make money through this. But we're not really talking about me or you. Sweet Baby Inc. is allowed to offer this service, regardless of how others feel about it, and game developers are allowed to pay them for this service if that's what they want to spend their money on. This is all part of freedom of expression and free speech. Just like how Cabrutus is allowed to make the Sweet Baby Inc. Detective Curator Group, People are allowed to boycott whatever game they want, for whatever reason they want, as that's their freedom of expression. And so developers can make progressive games, and players can dislike progressive games, and ultimately, the free market will decide who's right. Some people genuinely do like progressive or woke games, and some people don't. There is demand for both sides, as different people have different political beliefs and backgrounds. And if there really are far too many progressive games, which might be true these days, then supply will outpace demand and these games will perform worse, creating a clear financial incentive for developers to not do this. Likewise, if most players really do just want modern politics kept away from video games, then more apolitical games will perform better, as there is high demand and low supply. So, for once, this is a problem that the free market can and will take care of by itself, and all this performative culture war outrage is unnecessary. But at least all of this outrage and engagement farming must help the situation, right? Surely this will at least make video games a little better? I mean, just look at the original Gamergate. That led to loads of outrage, and everyone knows that afterwards, all problems in games journalism just disappeared, and video games instantly became less political. Oh, wait, no, it was actually the opposite. The games industry responded directly by becoming way more progressive and openly political, while starting to view non-progressive voices more negatively due to their association with the worst elements of Gamergate, this is what actually happens in the culture war. People double down and division grows. But hey, maybe this time will be different. After all, everyone talking about this seems so calm and reasonable. An ideological Marxist hole which is rotting the West. That literally is actively trying to undermine Western civilization. They hate us and they want us gone or even dead would be preferable to them. Uh, these people are fucking scum. Like, there's no other way to describe this. You are fucking scum. These people are evil. The people involved with Sweet Baby Inc. are evil. Huh, and there was me worried this would just turn into sensationalist engagement farming. Well, surely this will save gaming. You know, any day now. We probably just need a few more YouTube videos about how game developers are evil, and they hate all gamers, and they want us dead, particularly white men. And then guess what? All those game developers are going to turn around, abandon all of their political beliefs, and start catering to the people depicting them as evil, hate-filled racists. Because everyone knows the best way to win a political argument is just call everyone who disagrees with you a racist. Wait, what? That's it? That's the big grand strategy of Gamergate 2? Just call everyone with a different opinion racist? 
while trying to cancel people on Twitter for barely offensive or out-of-context old tweets? And this is the anti-woke side. What the fuck is this? So, here's how it started. As a man who enjoyed the early 2000s, let me tell you something. People today are so easily offended, it's hard for me to believe anyone when they say, This person is a racist or a misogynist. Huh, I agree. People today can at times be too easily offended. And it is hard to take some people seriously when they cry racist all the time. Anyway, here's that same person two weeks later calling four different people racist. Does this article mention anything about the Sweet Baby Inc. CEO being a full-blown racist? Because I have a feeling this article doesn't mention that. Lego Butts is psychotic and racist is all get up and go. The same day, everyone on Twitter finally took notice of the fairly racist developer that's now working for EA that used to work at Sweet Baby. What do the white developers do that's so evil? She can't tell you. They're just existing and she's a racist. There you go. The Sweet Baby Inc. CEO being a full-blown racist is a claim that has been repeated constantly, by the way. And the source for this claim is just the picky baby clip from earlier. Yes, forget lynchings and apartheid and stuff. This is the full-blown racism. Saying that gamers are a bit like picky babies who only want to eat the same food. YouTubers have been crying racist constantly over the last weeks, while frequently saying things that seem deliberately designed to just stir up racial animosity like this. They despise you if you're a gamer and you're a white male. That is the one thing that all of these game companies seemingly have in common who want white male gamers out of their space. They don't want to make games for you anymore. They don't want you to play their games. They fucking hate white men. That's the bottom line. These people who go out there and openly say, I fucking hate gamers. I fucking hate white people. I hate white men. So inclusion and sensitivity actually just means getting rid of white characters. Gotcha. Norse mythology, a bit too white. Let's blackface it. Saga Anderson, well, unfortunately, that Scandinavian woman looked a bit too white. Let's blackface her as well. Well, thank you so much for letting us know how much you hate white people and despise white people. Sweet Baby Inc. is full of racist. Nobody in the mainstream media reports this. You can discriminate, alienate, and push people out of industries as long as they're white men and women, I guess person in charge of the entirety of Xbox's marketing also believes that white male players are the devil, but their community manager hates white people. They just straight up hate them because these people unequivocally, they hate you if you're a white person. Still, at least early on in this controversy, there were actually some examples the great witch hunt produced that did seem a little bit racist or at least rather dumb. For example, saying you can't be racist against white people is not a helpful thing to say at the best of times, but particularly not in this context. Complaining that white people can be difficult to be around because they cause microaggressions does, I guess, raise questions about that person. And there was one tweet from 2012, first discovered in the original Gamergate, which resurfaced, and yeah, that one's actually offensive, I guess although it's hard to know how offensive without any context. But anyway, what was the punishment for a 12-year-old offensive tweet again? But this was just the start, so let's skip ahead to today, today being the day I'm writing this, to look where the witch hunts have got to now. And just to make life easier, I'll stick to Mark Kern, aka Grums's Twitter feed. This is a man who has spent years and years talking about how much he hates cancel culture. And yet now that he has a little bit of power and influence himself, he spends all day, every day, trying to get game developers cancelled for things he finds offensive. So I guess I'll just go down Mark's timeline chronologically so that there's no cherry picking on my side. So the first offender is a community manager for Helldivers 2 with hardly any followers, who has committed the crime of problematic tweets. In the first, she calls Helldivers pretty woke and says that it's a satire of jingoism. And in the second, 
She says that Helldivers didn't ban people from Discord for asking for LGBT capes, but instead for bigotry and hate speech. Mark says this is an unacceptable level of politics, that she is misrepresenting what Helldivers is actually about, presumably by calling it satire, and that she is clearly an activist in what should be a neutral role. Earlier, Mark also accused her of having a trans and Palestine flag in her bio on Discord, which he also considered to be unacceptable at the time. Mark would also encourage his many followers to complain about this person to Arrowhead CEO directly, and since being targeted by Mark, she has set her Twitter to private, something that is a common trend now and is frequently used as proof of further guilt. Next up, i.e. a few minutes earlier, Mark found evidence of a Ubisoft CM who used the word cracker in a tweet from 2017. Context is hidden here, and the message seems friendly and very likely not racial. But Mark says cracker is a hateful slur regardless of context. Sorry, cracker industry, I guess you're not allowed to exist. Thanks, Mark. Earlier problematic tweets show she talked about gender being an issue in the industry, said that streamer Ninja has white privilege, talked about diversity being important, and complained that white men hearing body positive automatically think fat. This person has since deleted their entire account after being targeted by Mark, so she must be extra guilty, I guess. The previous day, we have an Insomniac game CM who is accused of showing a desire for political violence because of tweets as old as 2011, which show him saying things like, Trump can catch these fucking hands, and can someone beat Tucker Carlson's ass already, amongst others. Then there is a CM for Fallout Prime who is accused of sending fake racist harassment to herself, something she has tried to provide evidence is not true, but Mark says it is true and that this is very serious. I think it's worth pointing out that the top poster accusing her of faking this racist harassment has a reference to hating N-words in their profile and their own timeline is mostly just many clips of proud white supremacist Nick Fuentes. But according to Mark, this is actually all a lie to make gamers look bad. Next, there is an XCM from Conan Exiles who Mark says hates gamers, especially the white ones. The evidence of this is two tweets. One from 2019 saying the scales are tipped in favor of white men and the other from 2014 saying playing as a regular ass white guy is boring. So yeah, this is just an example of some of the most recent people Mark has been targeting. Now keep in mind that these are not people who have targeted or interacted with Mark in any way. These are just strangers that he thinks needs to be publicly highlighted and shamed to be made accountable for the bad things they've done. Like have different political opinions and sometimes voice them while working in the gaming industry in a public facing role. Now in Mark's defense, Sometimes, when he's highlighting people for no other reason than to send large amounts of harassment at them, he does tell his followers not to harass them. That's his defense. Genuinely. And, of course, like all people obsessed with trying to ruin the lives of other people for fun, Mark also makes sure to constantly remind his followers that he is actually the real victim and that he is the person who gets the most harassment. Although he doesn't provide any evidence of this, outside of reposting the same couple of mild examples again and again. Meanwhile, people Mark has targeted have shown examples of both far more harassment and far more extreme harassment, including threats of violence, rape, racism, anti-Semitism, and images of them being photoshopped into rape scenes. And that's just the stuff these non-harassers have posted openly on Twitter. There is a term for what Mark is doing, and that is cry-bullying. He is constantly attacking other people under the guise of freeing the gaming industry from political activists, and he is constantly painting himself as a victim despite him always being the instigator. The truth is, Mark wants to be harassed, and is doing what he's doing precisely to try to provoke harassment, 
so that he can then use that harassment to continue to paint himself as the real victim of the evil racist political activists who are trying to destroy gaming. But like a lot of professional internet victims, there is not enough supply of actual harassment to meet the demands of his narrative and so he has to act to try to create the harassment. And in this way, Mark Kern is a pretty good representative of what Gamergate 2 seems to have become. In fact, now that I'm writing this, it's hard not to be reminded that this was also how it all started. The discovery of Sweet Baby Inc. by 4chan was declared the biggest scandal in gaming history due to them being linked to games suspected of pushing a woke agenda and the CEO being apparently Jewish and their apparent links to paedophilia. And then YouTubers got on board to create hit piece after hit piece after hit piece, sometimes even showing the original conspiracy-laden 4chan threads in the process while making claims that this company is the ESG wing of BlackRock, is destroying Western civilization, has the power to censor all YouTube videos talking about them, has killed the Western gaming industry, is involved with and will presumably destroy over 70 major games, including Grand Theft Auto 6, that they are fascists who will destroy all who don't agree with them, and of course, that they are forcing developers to change their games against these developers' wishes. Hit piece after hit piece, conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory, month after month, millions of total views, easily hundreds of total threads, and yet the very first time a Sweet Baby Inc. employee makes a response, suddenly everything before this is conveniently removed from the narrative to paint Sweet Baby Inc. as the real harassers, the only harassers, and the ones who started it. People bullied this company for months and months and then cried the very first time they pushed back. And this worked perfectly. So this is what Gamergate 2 is really about. Since its inception, this kind of thing has happened repeatedly. I mean, I'm not even sure I need to give examples as they're so abundant, and I think the thumbnails and video titles probably managed to speak for themselves. Just look at how many times YouTubers repeated that they hate us, they want us dead, they hate white men, and other things about how they are the real victims of things like racism, hate, and violence. Or look at the lawsuit claims that are being made. There is no lawsuit, by the way. There is one cease and desist letter, which is not a lawsuit, and it wasn't sent to a YouTuber. And yet YouTubers turn this into multiple videos about a lawsuit against them that is trying to silence them because they need to paint themselves as the real victim. Or look at Revsay's, Desu's and other people's completely fake tweets that they just make up to show off the terrible things their enemies have said. Or the terrible things they wish their enemies had said because sometimes you need to fake a tweet to prove you're the real victim. And then there is the obsession these YouTubers have with the word gaslighting, where every time they see someone present a different opinion to them, they just accuse them of gaslighting. Homeland Security branch will gaslight you into believing that it isn't Sweet Baby's fault? And these companies and security groups will defend these people who are openly racist while condemning and gaslighting the millions of players out there? This Gamergate 2 electric boogaloo nonsense all started because a consulting group attempted to silence the voice of a person for making a search engine optimization tool. That's what it is. So they can gaslight you, lie, and try to shift the truth in whatever way they want to. But the truth is that no one is going to believe these lies. Because of course, different opinions are basically the same thing as prolonged emotional abuse. At least they are if you need to always portray yourself as a victim. And so the entire movement has come to be built around constant crybullying and self-victimization, usually involving race, where the goal is to try to provoke a response from the people being targeted so they can create more content, farm more engagement, and earn more money. And this only works so well because one side is far bigger than the other, and so they actually can control the narrative, at least on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, I think it's worth at least showing what happens when a YouTuber goes against the narrative, as was the case with Bellular, 
when he accidentally committed the horrendous crime of not talking about Sweet Baby Inc. on a video about venture capital in gaming that included Kotaku's switch to focusing on guides. This video is largely critical of Kotaku, mostly because Bellular claims the switch to guides is about trying to artificially game SEO and Google search results to get more hits with lower quality work. But the video does also say that Kotaku has done good work in the past. Here's an example. Specifically with Kotaku, where, yeah, there have been some really clownish articles or just, you know, pop culture wank that's it's just kind of clickbaity bullshit. Um, amidst that, there is plenty of like decently real coverage. Within the last like week and a half, two weeks, um, they broke the story of the Overwatch single player content effectively being canned. So the video did say some positive things about Kotaku's work, and it didn't mention Sweet Baby Inc. at all. Now, the Gamergate 2 narrative is that Kotaku switched the guides because of the backlash over their coverage of Sweet Baby Inc. The problem with this is that there is loads of evidence of Kotaku having major problems and bleeding senior staff long before this controversy started. So presumably, this gaming news channel that doesn't usually talk about culture war politics didn't think it was necessary to talk about culture war politics here. And yet, for one man, this type of non-political news coverage is just unacceptable. Yes, obviously it was Mark Kern. If cancelling is going on in gaming right now, it's almost always being started or led by Mark. Anyway, Mark wasn't the only one. Lots of other YouTubers joined into Dogpile, like YouTuber Kyle, accusing Bellula of being shills, defending racists, acting inhuman, and being cancer. Kael made quite a few tweets about this, where he maintains that his side are the ones being kind. If you want to know what kindness looks like, by the way, just scroll down from this very tweet for some examples. You know, just kind things like accusing Bellular of being a paedophile. You know, just your basic kindness. Things would get even worse for Bellular, however, as it turned out that the publisher for his game had once worked with a different studio that had once worked with Sweet Baby Inc. And so he was also guilty of being connected to Sweet Baby Inc. by this association. Anyway, this led to many hit pieces on YouTube. These YouTubers also directed their own audiences to Brigade Bellular's videos while using the dislike ratio to support their narrative, which is why you can see the dislike ratio grow as more videos are made. And again, they are getting ratioed on this channel once again for this disastrous take. And the like to dislike ratios basically prove that point exactly. And that dislike ratio speaks more volumes than anything else you could possibly imagine. But this ass kissing has not gone well for Bellior as they have gotten ratioed pretty damn bad and may have destroyed their own channel. Now, you may wonder why ratioing videos on YouTube has become more popular in the past couple years and why certain YouTubers keep going on about it. And I do feel I have a bit of an obligation here to tell you that it's because dislikes on YouTube are fake now. The return YouTube dislikes extension only works for videos from 2021 and older. For videos newer than this, the extension has no actual data and only works by creating an estimate based on the activity of people with the extension installed, which is the vast minority. This means you only need a small number of people to brigade a video to create a really big dislike ratio, and that's why this type of brigading has become so much more popular. Of course, us YouTubers know this or can easily check because we have access to the real dislike numbers and can see that they're very often different. But viewers don't know this, so this is an effective way to artificially inflate dislikes to support certain narratives. Anyway, luckily, Bellula didn't engage much further, which is good, as if he pushed back, these channels would just do their normal cry-bully, we're the real victims routine to get even more content. But this does give you an indication of what happens when someone simply commits the terrible crime of not talking about this subject. Because this is all about us versus them, and if you're not 100% with us, you must be the enemy and should be treated as such. So do not sit there and pretend that they are anything other than what they are. They are a disease. They are a 
absolute disease in the video game world and they need to be treated as such. And when you're going to sit there and just dance around these topics and pretend that there's something else, you even talked about the Sweet Baby Inc. employees and you danced around that. I, this is absolutely insane to me. Not only are we seeing the actual schism between journalists and gamers separate and grow even further with Gamergate 2, we're now seeing it happen with, in fact, YouTubers, where many people are now being what I would consider to be compromised and are defending these journalists and these practices rather than actually understanding who, in fact, pays their adsense and their bills. That is you, the viewer. You know, nothing says we're the good guys and our arguments are correct like trying to bully and silence all opposition thought while declaring any different opinions to be insane or compromised. And if this is how they treat people being neutral, imagine what they would do if someone were to actually disagree with them. I didn't want to make this video. My audience isn't built around politics or drama or anything culture war related. So there's no reward for me for making a video like this. There is considerable risk, however. Talking about politics alone is risky and political content creators are only successful because they reaffirm their audience's opinions, not because they change anyone's minds. Trying to change minds on the internet is hard, particularly when people have had months to poison the well against their enemy and everyone's minds have long been made up. So talking politics is risky, criticizing other YouTubers is risky, trying to change people's minds is risky. This video is basically all risk, zero reward. I didn't want to make this video, but a lie is a lie, no matter how many people believe it. And this whole movement was built on lies and I watched it happen. For some people, Sweet Baby Inc. is something they've only heard of relatively recently. But I saw the early 4chan threads. I saw people create this conspiracy of a secretive organization run by Jews and funded through BlackRock who were the reason for the downfall of modern gaming. And I saw YouTubers pick this conspiracy up, remove the Jewish part while keeping everything else, and feed this to an audience who ate it up eagerly. And I guess that alone isn't that surprising. Anti-woke sentiment has been building for years, with the dislike only growing in intensity over time, and now YouTubers were finally telling people who was to blame. This one little company destroying all your favorite games. So that part didn't surprise me, but I have to admit, the way this story would later blow up and be covered by genuinely large figures with the narrative always being heavily controlled to paint Sweet Baby Inc. as the villains, while anyone who spoke in their defense was immediately shut down and often bullied into silence amidst a witch hunt that embodied the worst parts of online politics that was being carried out by the people who are meant to be the most critical of this. That part did surprise me. Still, even if misinformation was used extensively to control these events, None of this would have worked if the message being pushed didn't resonate with people. The narrative might have been fake, but the way people felt about it was real. And I've read enough comments on the videos in this video to see and believe that. There really are a large number of people who play games that are sick of constant progressive pandering and double standards on race and feeling ignored by an industry they are a part of. There is genuine resentment to the way politics has been handled by the gaming industry, where one side is always represented and catered to, and one side is ignored or vilified. And with time, resentment grows, and things like Gamergate 2 are the result. Developers absolutely have the right to put whatever they want in their games. They can make them as political as possible, they can virtual signal all day long, and they can make political statements on social media, even slightly controversial ones, and none of that means they deserve harassment. But if the gaming industry does want to be so openly political, it will breed resentment from those who don't feel represented. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, I'm just saying that that is what happens. That's how the culture war works, and it doesn't seem like there are many real winners to this war. 
In fact, often the harder you push, the more people seem to undermine their own message. And so to me, all you can really do is push back against the misinformation and immoral methods. Speaking of which, can someone remind me again what was the issue with those games journalists everyone says they hate? Because I thought it was that they sometimes inserted their political beliefs into news coverage and game reviews, that they complain too much that everything is racist, that they tried to cancel people at times for minor wrongthink, that they created an echo chamber where alternative views are rarely expressed, that they acted together to collude at times to all promote the same message, and most of all, the biggest complaint, the most annoying and most often cited, that they mass produce low quality, sensationalist rage bait for easy clicks. At least, that's what I thought everyone's problem with games journalists was, but clearly I was mistaken, because all of those things apply to certain YouTubers far more than they ever applied to games journalists, and that's not really intended as praise for journalists. So clearly, people's problems weren't that games journalists were political, it's that they didn't share their politics. Just like people don't care that games are political, they care that they don't represent their politics. Because this is all about politics, just like it always is with the culture war, and you've all become so consumed by the culture war that you don't even realize you're guilty of all the same things you apparently stand against. I mean, you report the news in as biased a way as possible, and your audience cheers you for it, You've built yourself one of the most insulated echo chambers on the entirety of YouTube. Everything is us versus them, where you depict people with different views to you as evil, literally sometimes. You use selective representation to paint everyone on the other side as racist over a handful of examples, many of which aren't even that offensive. You try to cancel people over years old tweets, many of which are also barely offensive. In fact, you're all so desperate for things to be outraged over that for Stella Blade, you had to find something in French to have something to cry about, and you all kept crying about it for weeks and weeks. And of course, no matter what you do, no matter how much you harass or how much you hate or how much you instigate, you always claim that you are the real victim. I am genuinely sympathetic to people who don't feel represented by the gaming industry, and have problems with the political nature of games media or video games themselves. But that sympathy runs out when you act worse than the other side. And I know that the other side sometimes does bad things too, and I haven't focused on that much in this video. But there is no doubt in my mind over which side has acted worse in Gamergate 2. And honestly, it's not even close. Thank you for watching. Okay, normal viewers. I am sorry that this isn't the Baldur's Gate video. I know that this isn't what most people subscribe for. I know you don't like politics or drama or whatever. I know, I've heard you before, I know. But it is the times when no one else speaks out on an issue that I feel in the deepest recesses of my being that I have to say something. And I felt like I had to make this video. Sorry. All right, that's it for me. Hopefully not for the final time of my career. We'll find out, eh? Uh, I'll see you in the next video, which, you know, the it, the Boulder's Gate video that, that will probably 100% probably be next. Maybe.